But why don't we first uh, hear from Justice Mansour Ali Shah from Pakistan? Do you want to use the podium? No, I just. Okay. Uh, I just want to bring in a dimension relating to the design of the law itself. You see, that'll be my sort of input today. Uh, in the context of enforcement, if we look at the design of the national law, and I'll showcase <coughs> Pakistan here, because I think the law itself, which uh, emanates out of CITES uh, as a national legislation, and there might be parallels in the region also, there seems to be a serious uh, set of confusions and defects which would certainly impair enforcement. And it is in that context that I want to talk about some of the areas which I think are seriously flawed as far as the uh, national law is concerned. Uh, just a few dates, uh, 1976 is when we ratified uh, the CITES Convention in Pakistan and the law, national law, was put in place in 2010. So that kind of gives you an idea uh, of the time lag. Now I'm going to talk about the national legislation, which I think around this year, a number of other countries have also come up with this law. So I don't know if they've sorted this problem that I'm going to highlight. I think the first uh, dimension or first aspect is the whole uh, interlinkage uh, or the linkages between customs and management authority and the courts. I think it is absolutely hazy. There is nothing that comes out as to how is the management authority going to operate in the scheme of things. And if I were to read my own law in 2010, customs is totally out because this law prevails over all the existing laws. So customs doesn't figure in the Pakistani law. So I don't know who actually is the frontline enforcer. But if I were to say customs is, then customs law comes into play, and they have a special court of their own. So will that special court, which is a special judge custom, who's going to try this? It's not clear. So it is just, uh, it's not clear as to how the management authority is going to play the role vis-a-vis -vis judges and the customs. Uh, it's just not clear. Uh, one would understand that CITE says that if uh, the specimen is uh, confiscated, it has to be brought to the management authority. Now, if that is with the management authority, what is in the control of the judge? Because juris normal jurisprudence of criminal law tells us that if a judge were to seize, uh, seize it of a matter, the case property remains under the control of the judge till he decides the matter. So if it is with the management authority and they, they, can, they have the right to deal with it, then what's the court really doing without the actual property in hand? So it doesn't make sense to me. It's very interesting, actually, that there is no, nothing in the law that talks about the animal itself. I mean, where does the animal go? Or where does the specimen go after the case has been reported or the violation has been reported? CITES says it goes to the management authority. There is nothing in the law which says, what does this management authority do with it? Because the judges might take about six years just deciding a case. And you know the statistics that I've gathered just for this conference, there are only 16 cases in Pakistan that have been reported pending for the last six years. So I don't know where those animals are. So where are the animals? I mean, aren't we doing all this for the animals? But then the, nobody knows where they are. So the law doesn't talk about it. There are no rules that specify. And I'll be very interested to know if in the region, uh, the national laws have really talked and catered about what to do with the animals, what to do with the other specimens or the items, and where do they end up, and who looks after them. Uh, then, of course, the law doesn't really talk about time frame. I mean, there is a time frame for banking laws, and there's time frame for company laws, and the matter should be decided expeditiously. There seems to be no time frame for deciding these matters, considering that the property in hand or the subject matter is the, the animal itself. So that seems to be missing. Uh, then, of course, it also doesn't talk about the appellate structure. I mean, you could be stuck in appellate structure for the next 10 years. You might be filing appeals and appeals and appeals to the Supreme Court after the customs judge. So that's hardly any deterrence. I mean, that's very easy then. Uh, you get a bail, and then the trial goes on, and the appeals go on. The, the national law doesn't really talk about it. CITES uh, being the principal fundamental law under which these national laws are emanating is silent also. So we don't know what's the structure. Should we just have one appeal to the Supreme Court and then finish the matter, or should it have several appellate stages? Not clear. So that. then the other major disconnect is between the wildlife law, which is for our country is a colonial law prior to CITES, and then the CITES law. So we need to put that in place. Uh, there's a disconnect in the sense that maybe there's a preparation for an export within the, the, in, in the inland. And while before it gets to the port, suppose if it's caught, CITES doesn't apply. And it will be the local law that will apply. Now that has its own regime, its own judges, its own system, and very meager penalties, as pointed out earlier, about $10 or so. 
But the minute that product or specimen gets to the port, then all of a sudden the CITES law comes into place. So the two different jurisprudential themes at work, while the whole thing should have been brought under one law. And I think CITES does not uh, stop us, any, any country, from uh, developing a legislation that were to be more uh, inclusive, <laughs> would include the inland offenses also, and it could have easily be done. But somehow there's a disconnect, and uh, that, that doesn't really make sense, because uh, if you look at the inland wildlife cases, there are tons and tons of magistrates operating inland who probably don't have any clue how, what to do with those animals. And uh, the little investigation that I did before coming, they said if they catch the birds, they would let the birds go, thinking that it probably goes back into its natural uh, habitat. No idea. They've slaughtered some of them. They thought it's really good meat. And uh, I don't know. So it's, it's been a chaos as far as the internal inland wildlife department is concerned. Uh, there is no prescription under the law as to what is to be done with those animals. So I think that needs to be looked at. Then, of course, the, the whole area of penalties, you see, uh, of course, it has to have, uh, it, monetary penalty has to be more, of course, $10 and $100 won't do. Uh, but, of course, something like blacklisting of the trader, because I've, I've noticed that uh, certain importers are doing this, there are certain groups who are doing this, so if we were to do blacklist the companies or the uh, associated companies, something on that side, so perhaps also looking at their accounts and freezing their accounts if need be. So we need to be slightly more innovative on the penalty side rather than just impose a penalty of $1,000 or something to that effect. So that's, that's important. Uh, then, of course, the point that I raised earlier also that uh, there is, again, a disconnect between the concept of environment. And I just heard Justice Hamid. I don't know the green quotes that Justice Hamid just referred to, and he pointed out later on that CITES is not part of it. So while we're looking at the entire debate on environment and the environment uh, legislation, the environmental green benches, they do not really cover the CITES law. So CITES is operating on the side, as it were, whereas the environment green benches that we so talk about, which are far more advanced now, and we've had a lot of capacity done in those areas, do not look at CITES. So it might be a little tweaking required at the national level if we were to just include CITES into our national legislation, have one consolidated law for environment would make a lot more sense rather than having several laws uh, for different for wildlife, different for environment, and different for CITES, which is hanging on the side. So we could all consolidate, and I think it doesn't offend the convention itself. So that needs a little thought by the legislatures at the national level as, as to how to have one consolidated law with one little or one specialized court that looks into all these aspects. And I think it will be easier for us to train uh, judges who are, you know, sitting in the specialized courts rather than just, you know, subjecting them to general law and sending them all out. Then the law also does not talk about whistleblowers. I think that needs to be uh, factored in. It says that a complaint ought to be filed by an enforcer or the enforcement department. I think that just limits it. I think we should have the public come out and raise it and have some sort of whistleblowing concept because this is something that is to do with whistleblowing, and somebody's got to raise it, and that is a kind of uh, uh, missing. And of course, lastly, I would say that uh, I think we, we need to, if we were to just think of a design which is more consolidated, and we have a specialized set of courts, then we have less people to train also, because we certainly need to train them. But we must clearly spell out in the law what what are the role, what are the duties of these judges that they have to perform? Currently, I think the general magistrate who is administering criminal law, frankly, with great respect to my judges there, have no clue what is to be done with the animal itself. I haven't got a single case, as IT says, that you're supposed to return the uh, specimen back to the country. I don't have a single example to report from my country. I heard John Scanlon the other day say that uh, there's an annual report on the website of CITES telling you about what the countries are doing. I went to the website. I downloaded what Pakistan had to offer. And all it said was a little graph telling us what imports we made. And that's actually the information coming from the licenses issued by the management authority, not about the violations, not about the animals. So I'm not quite sure if uh, would like to meet up with somebody from the CITES secretary to tell me as to what kind of information are we seeking from the countries, because I think there's a lot missing in the information we're collecting from the countries. We're simply collecting licenses issued, which I wonder would be relevant. I think what is important is what are the violations, what kind of penalties we impose, what are the animals involved, what has happened to the animals, what's happened to the specimen. That in literature 
is not on the CITES website, and I don't know where to look for it. So these are some of the thoughts that I had on this law, and I think we need to really sit down and go back to the drawing board on this one thing.